are seeing the price of renewable energy dropping drastically. We're seeing the clean tech market growing exponentially. We're seeing significant leadership from local governments and other provinces. And uh, what I, I would describe, and I think others have described, as sort of a, um, an undeniable momentum towards uh, climate action. So all of this uh, sort of is happening as we are heading into a provincial election here in British Columbia. And what we are hoping to discuss today is what all of this means for the future of climate policy in BC um, as we head into that election. So joining us today, we have four panelists who are going to share their thoughts on this question. Um, we have uh, uh, Jeremy Morehouse, who is the senior and a senior analyst at Clean Energy Canada, and he'll be sharing the results of a study that um, Pamina Clean Energy Canada and the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions did to model the impact of the government's climate leadership plan on carbon pollution. We have Elizabeth McSheffrey, who is the senior national reporter from, from, from the National Observer. And she's going to be sharing her reflections on the climate narrative that's emerging in BC as we lead into the election. We have Joel Wood, who is an assistant professor at the School of Business and Economics at Thompson Rivers University. And he's going to be talking a bit about um, carbon pricing, the BC carbon tax, and the, the Liberal and BC climate plans. And finally, we have Andrea Reimer, who's a counselor at the City of Vancouver, who'll be sharing uh, some of the experiences from the City of Vancouver as they move towards their goal of 100% renewable energy by 2050. So with that, I am going to pass the floor over to Jeremy, who will kick us off. Thanks very much, Joshua. Um, I just need to share my screen. One second. There we go. Um, so I'm just going to go through um, a piece of work that we did with the Pemmin Institute and uh, the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions that should help to put in, in context you know, where carbon pollution is headed in, in the province um, and what this means for the different parties as you move towards the election and for uh, the new government we'll have in May. This piece of work, um, uh, the um, provincial government released its climate plan in, in August of last summer. And uh, I know myself, I was pouring through that plan and staff at the Penn Institute and Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions wondering, well, what does this mean for carbon pollution in, uh, in British Columbia? Is it going to go down? Is it going up? Um, what's happening in different sectors? But as we went through the plan, there's a lot of detail in there, but you can't really answer that question from, from what's in the plan um, in terms of where carbon pollution is going in the province. So we commissioned uh, Navius Research to help us answer that question, taking the policies in that plan plus the federal carbon price um, to then see what that means for carbon pollution. And we had a number of key conclusions uh, from that work. The first one is that carbon pollution will increase um, uh, in, underneath the plan. Uh, in 2016, emissions from buildings, transport, industry, utilities, LNG, and natural gas uh, was around six, 60 million tons. If we look at our forecast uh, from those same sectors that would grow to 68 million tons under the climate plan with the federal carbon price. Now that growth of 8 million tons is actually quite significant. That's the equivalent of adding 2 million cars to the road. Um, and it's also quite significant when you consider the direction that we're trying to head. Uh, BC doesn't have a 2030 target, but the federal government does for Canada as a whole. Um, if you then try to translate that into, you know, BC's share of that, it'd be around 46 million tons. So it's gone up eight under the forecast uh, instead of going down to 46. And so that, you know, there's a challenge there. That question mark is, well, how do you, how do you get that? Uh, chunk of reductions between now and 2030. Now, there's a lot of detail in this report, and it's available online, the technical report and all the spreadsheets. I encourage those on the phone to 
um, or, or on the computer to go take a look at that. But I'll share some of the, the data from it just to get a sense of the richness of information in there. So we started with looking at, well, what would happen um, yeah, if there wasn't that climate plan in, in place? So August, as of August 18th last year, all the policies in place, where would we go? And that's this green line you're seeing on your screen. Um, so an increase from today to 2030 and then flatlining. And that's really existing policies, keeping economic growth, population growth, uh, emissions uh, in check, but not really bringing them down. If you bring in the BC Climate Plan with the federal carbon price, from those same sources I mentioned in the last slide, buildings, transport, uh, LNG, natural gas, and industry, um, you do see a reduction. So it changes from that reference case. But no matter which target you look at, if you look at our 2020 target, BC has a 2050 target, or you know a, a BC version of the federal target, um, we're off from all three of those. I also want to note that in the uh, in the BC Climate Plan, there are a number of commitments in forestry um, to help reduce emissions, planting more trees, um, uh, and different forestry practices. Uh, we didn't model that because our, our model um, wasn't built to do that that kind of assessment, um, and there wasn't a lot of detail in the plan. But if you take the government numbers at face value, uh, it would be lower than emissions would be lower in 2050 than today. It's still quite a wide gap. 41 million tons, including forestry, or 53 without. And I just want to note that this is a, a fairly generous assessment of, um, of reductions because it assumes everything in the plan uh, is implemented, um, receives um, budget to, to, to be put in place, and happens on time. Now, second point, uh, when you look, dig a bit deeper, so where where's that carbon pollution growth coming from? Um, a lot of that is from LNG and then the natural gas production to, to feed into those LNG facilities. Today, natural gas is about a quarter of emissions, 14 million tons. But obviously, it doesn't include LNG because the facilities haven't been built. If you assume a certain number of those facilities are built uh, out to 2030, um, some of the projects that are already approved, uh, that grows to 30 million tons and nearly half of the emissions in British Columbia. There's other stuff happening in the other sectors like transport and buildings and, uh, and in the industrial sector more generally, but that's, um, that's what we see. The, the LNG sector is a, is, a, is a challenge if it's developed. You have two minutes, Jeremy. Thanks, Joshua. Um, and we also see fossil fuels remain the dominant source of energy uh, in 2030, and we know from our own work at Clean Energy Canada um, and other assessments, renewable energy has to be playing a, a bigger role in that time frame. More than half of our uh, energy should come from those sources um, in 2030 to, to hit those targets. Now that's a quick scan of the challenge. Um, I like to spend most of my time talking about the opportunities um, and then the ability to overcome those challenges. And this last slide is a piece of work that we did um, uh, over a year ago now, looking at how BC could reduce emissions and, and grow its economy. Um, and it absolutely can do that. I'll use a quick example just to demonstrate what that looks like. Um, the clean growth or uh, environmental goods sector around the world is a, is a $1.2 trillion market right now. Um, and BC is in a good position to export um, ideas, technologies, services into that growing market. Um, in the plan, in the climate plan in 2008, uh, Ballard uh, received support to demonstrate its fuel cell buses in Whistler. I'm sure a lot of people rode on those buses or have seen them at least. Um, in, in just July, uh, Ballard signed a an estimated $178 million deal with a Chinese company called Synergy um, to roll out that technology in, in buses in, in a growing Chinese market for that technology. So it's supported by policy in British Columbia that then helps organizations here to, to grow and, and export to those markets. When you put this all together and the challenges for a new government, carbon pollution is forecast to grow. LNG and natural gas are a big, a big challenge. Um, fossil fuels remain the dominant source of energy in BC up to 2030. But we do know from our work and others that BC can grow its economy and reduce carbon pollution. So there's a lot of opportunities there. And I'll end it there. Thanks, Joshua. 
Great, thanks, Jeremy. So, um, as I mentioned, if you have any questions as they go along for, for any of our speakers, please feel free, free to throw them into the question box and we'll get, them, get to them at the end. Um, I'd now like to pass the presentation over to Elizabeth McSheffrey from the National Observer. Great. Thanks very much, Joshua. Can everybody see my screen? Is it working? Working on our end. Okay, great. Uh, so I just want to start by saying that uh, nothing I'm about to say uh, represents any kind of political opinion or, or the perspective of National Observer. Uh, I'm just providing my observations over two years of covering BC climate politics. Uh, and I want to start by saying that when I came to Vancouver two years ago, I was so impressed uh, by how green British Columbia was. We had, uh, you know, I saw my first ever electric car charging station. All the buses were electric. We had so much green space, so many beautifully protected provincial parks. Uh, and I couldn't help but thinking, wow. BC is so green, they've nailed the environmental thing, they've nailed the climate thing. I was so impressed and I thought Ontario, my home province, was lagging so far behind. Um, and I, I realized immediately that I had a hard time understanding the difference between climate policy uh, and environmentalism. And I think that there, there's a base level of confusion in our publications readers sometimes in drawing the line between those two different things. So as we head forward into, an, into a provincial election, uh, these are the, some of the things that we can be thinking about as, as media, as environmental organizations, and how we communicate the uh, climate policy to the public. So the headlines tell a different story than what I had initially experienced uh, when I first came to BC. Um, as you can see, uh, National Observer as a publication uh, has tried to look uh, very critically at the, the discourse around BC climate policy. So you can see some of these headlines that there's a very clear difference in what the government is saying about its own climate policies and what climate scientists and environmentalists are saying about those same policies. So how do we as media cut through that rhetoric, rhetoric and present to the public the, the core facts? So over the last year I've had a, I've had a hard time uh, getting the information that I'm looking for on BC climate policy from the government. I've never succeeded in getting an interview with the environment minister uh, and if I'm lucky I get the government responses three days past my deadline. And that's not necessarily unique uh, for a government. Governments carefully control their messages and they're frequently overwhelmed with media requests. Um, but as, as journalists it's really hard for us to know, hard for us to decipher between what the government is saying and what its critics are saying. So one of the, the biggest examples I think over the last year is the BC Climate Plan and we've already heard from, from Dasha and others that uh, the Climate Plan was not on track to reduce emissions for at least a decade. Uh, it relied too heavily on agriculture and forestry to reduce emissions. It didn't fully adopt any of the climate leadership team recommendations uh, and, and the scientists chosen by the, the BC government to present at the climate leadership demonstration still said that the BC climate leadership plan had a really long way to go. But in posing these questions to the BC government, you know, how does the Pacific Northwest LNG project fit into BC's emissions targets? Uh, how does LNG development and oil and gas and the Kinder Morgan pipeline, how do all of these things fit within the BC's climate goals? Uh, it's really hard to get a straight answer on that. And what we've seen uh, as media covering this is the BC government repeatedly touting itself in the public as a world leader on climate policy, uh, a world leader on environmentalism. But we also have the Green Party, for example, saying that the BC government isn't a world leader. It's repealed cap and trade, failed to renew the Live Smart BC, program, it stopped increasing carbon tax, um, it's amended the Clean Energy Act to exclude emissions from liquefaction in the LNG industry, it shut down the Pacific Carbon Trust, 
so I, I take all this information as a journalist and I try and verify it. And what I get from the BC government when I put these questions to them is what really seems like a game of semantics, of true and false, of technicalities. So lots of people claim, for example, that emissions have gone up every year since Premier Clark took office. The BC government says that's false. And technically, emissions in 2014 were lower than they were in 2015. But inside that bubble, they still increased every year from about 2012. So it's, it's kind of true and it's kind of false. When people say the government has stopped increasing the carbon tax, that's technically true. But the BC government says that it has had no more legislated increases on schedule, so it can't technically stop the carbon tax. And that's also kind of true, and it's very confusing, and it's, it's a challenge to communicate this effectively with the public. So I think moving forward, uh, as, we, as we head into an election, as we head into a, a future that incorporates federal climate policies, uh, President Trump, uh, and, and all of the other uh, provincial initiatives in Canada, it's important to ask critical questions about how we disseminate this information to the public. Uh, the first is how to cut through government spin. Um, are, are the facts really the facts? Are there semantics games being played? Um, and, and how do we know who to believe? Do we believe government scientists saying one thing? Do we believe outside scientists saying another? How do we simplify that science and compact it in a way that the average reader finds appealing? Uh, how can we simplify uh, emissions charts? How can we change the dialogue so that it's applicable to, to the average person? Uh, and another question to ask is, is anybody doing it right? Is BC really an outlier? Is it doing far worse than anybody else? Who can we compare it to? Should we be comparing it to Alberta, given Alberta's very specific natural resources? Uh, should we be comparing it to Ontario, given that Ontario has uh, incredible solar power advantages? Um, so, so it's all about it's all about balance, and and f even asking the question about jurisdiction. Is it fair to, for example, consider the Kinder Morgan pipeline? or the Trans Mountain Expansion, I should say, an election issue. Ultimately, that's a federal, that's a federal decision. Um, who, do, who should we be upset with when there's an oil spill in English Bay? Is, are those waters under provincial jurisdiction? How much can the BC government really accomplish? Are we expecting the moon and stars from them? Are they doing far worse than anyone else? Or are they lagging behind what they're truly capable of? Do they have the resources to accomplish the challenges that we're putting in front of them? Uh, and especially as we <laughs> move towards working with uh, an administration south of the border that uh, has expressed not so friendly climate policy initiatives, uh, how can we use regional agreements, uh, state-level agreements to get around those? What opportunities for partnership are there? Uh, who are BC's partners and who can they learn from? Uh, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much for the airtime, Joshua. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, we will now pass it over to Joel Wood from Thompson Rivers University. Joel, we can't hear you. We can't hear me? Can oh, you hear me yeah, now? Now we can hear you. Yes, great. Okay. Can you see my webcam? Yes. And my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, I figured I was going to have slides for my own talking points, so I might as well share them if I could. Um, I just want to, uh, I'm an environmental economist, I'm a PhD in economics, um, so I just wanted to kind of talk about some of, uh, of the advantages of carbon pricing and why, why economists are often, often uh, um, um, advocating for carbon pricing in climate policy. Um, one of the main reasons is, I could go into maybe some jargon, but 
but to put it in kind of plain terms, um, carbon carbon taxes and carbon pricing um, involve lower require lower information um, for the government when they're implementing uh, um, when they're trying to reduce emissions. Um, it puts the emission reduction decisions in the hands of the individuals and businesses. So they they respond to the carbon price, um, and that really makes sure that we we pick all the low ha hanging fruit rather than grabbing some of the fruit that's up high that might be costly to get at. Um, so we go only go after the reductions that are kind of below the tax rate. Um, and, and usually this is considered the, lo the lowest cost way to achieve a specific reduction target. So if you, s you set the price and then you allow businesses and individuals to respond to that price and use their own kind of private information to, to uh, find the cheapest uh, reductions. Um, also, car carbon taxes and carbon pricing um, provides really strong incentives to innovate, to uh, find, find new uh, innovative ways to reduce emissions. So it gives this incentive to individuals and businesses to find these, these ways to innovate. And it's got this strong incentive because um, um, if you find a, way, a cheaper way to reduce emissions, um, you can lower your tax bill. So it's kind of got that double incentive. Um, and kind of carbon taxes as a form of carbon pricing, they also have the, the big advantage. They're simple to implement, re relatively simple compared to the other, other uh, um, um, climate policies that we have, policy instruments that we have. And they're also very transparent. They, they're transparent on purpose. We want that price to be, be as transparent as possible for people to respond to it. Um, BC, we, as we all know, we've had a carbon tax since 2008. This was kind of, a, I guess, Gordon Campbell's technocratic legacy. Well, the HST also is a technocratic policy, but that didn't work out so well. But the carbon tax is still here. Um, it hasn't, as other presenters have said, it hasn't been increased since 20, 2012. Um, um, uh, environmental economists have, have studied the, the tax and its impacts and and contrary to what you hear at the federal government level over the past few years, it's not a job killing carbon tax. Um, there's research that shows that after the tax was implemented, there was a net increase in jobs in, in BC, um, especially when you look at what happened in other jurisdictions in Canada um, and control for all these other factors. Um, the, the tax cuts that accompanied the tax, they probably also contributed to, to this increase in jobs. Um, it's hard to tease out, tease out what, a, what effect was due to the tax cuts, what effect would be due to the carbon tax, but the research does show that there was a shift in jobs from energy intensive um, sectors of the economy to less energy intensive sectors. Um, also, uh, often with carbon pricing, people accuse it of being regressive. Um, so how, putting a larger burden on, on lower income households. Um, and when the BC carbon tax was implemented, there was the refundable tax credit to low income um, individuals to help offset any regressive impact. Um, there's been analysis by uh, Nick, Nick Rivers and Randy Weigel and some of their PhD students that suggests that even without the tax credit and the accompanying uh, income tax cuts, um, that the policy would have been progressive, and that those those tax cuts and tax credit kind of made it even more progressive. Um, also, the carbon tax, well, it, it's had an impact. Um, um, it's lower, there's been research, quite a bit of research on this, um, looking at the data, and it's lower gasoline and natural gas use below kind of what it would have been, been otherwise and kind of they create a counterfactual using statistical methods and 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 this is really 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 important that that emissions would use of these these commodities would have been going up emissions would have been going up um, and the taxes help helped reduce those emissions over what they would have been in the counterfactual um, also it's been popular it's quite popular um, um, I, I know Pemba has done some 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 work on on, on uh, the carbon tax support, and it became more 
the increase in support after its implementation. But there was a, another recent study uh, about a year ago that looked at um, the carbon tax support across Canada, just for carbon taxes. And BC was really an outlier where almost in every BC federal electoral district, um, it had more than 50% of the population supporting the um, carbon taxes. Um, which is a really interesting uh, political political thing. Um, oh, okay, yeah, the climate plans. Um, yeah, I've got two minutes, Joel. Two minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, when I'm when I'm kind of looking at a, a climate plan, I'm looking for the details. I'm not looking. I'm trying to get past rhetoric about uh, about targets and how how um, and and wanting to meet the targets. I'm actually looking for the coverage of the plan and the stringency. Um, neither neither party kind of adopted the tax, neither the, um, the Liberals or the NDP adopted the tax schedule of the suggested by the climate leadership team. And I think part of that is due to the federal, federal uh, um, um, setting this carbon price floor which is now kind of become an anchoring point that that most jurisdictions don't seem to want to move past. Um, they just want to match it. Um, the NDP um, carbon tax schedule is m slightly more stringent than 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 the the Liberal Party's tax schedule, um, but they're very very similar. Um, neither plan with the with the details that I saw in the plans currently has the policy stringence to meet the, the 2050 target. Um, they will need additional policies um, to do that. Um, the, the plans do differ in their use of the revenue from the taxes. Um, since um, the, the Christie Clark Liberals have favored targeted tax credits, um, um, my, my least favorite is the one to the film industry. I don't necessarily see what the distortion it's correcting is there. Um, the NDP plan has favored more rebates plus some plus spending on, on energy efficiency and, and uh, transportation. Um, but the, both of these uses of revenue really differ from, from uh, uh, what, what had been done in the past with cutting distortionary taxes or even the climate leadership team's recommendations uh, of cutting the provincial sales tax. Um, politically, uh, looking at, at support for the tax, the tax is kind of, it's least popular in liberal strongholds. Um, so ridings where the liberals got, had a, won by quite a majority in 2013. Um, more popular in, in, in electoral districts that were kind of swing ridings in 2013, um, at, but even more popular in NDP kind of um, strongly held writings, um, so that might kind of give an input, give give some insight into why why the the, the carbon tax uh, schedules are kind of similar. They both they both really want those uh, swing districts. Thank you. Great, thanks, Joel. And for the final word on this subject, we are going to hand it over to Andrea Reimer from the City of Vancouver. Thanks very much, Joshua. Um, unlike Elizabeth, um, everything that I'm about to say represents a political opinion, um, but I did want to emphasize that um, it's a political opinion about mobilizing policy as opposed to anything personal or um, partisan. I'm not a member of any of the three parties, and that, that's a deliberate and advised um, decision based on my alignment with policy. Um, so I'm speaking today as a municipal representative and to note that as the street level of government and street level in air quotes there, um, we really have no choice but to deal with climate change. Environmental degradation is not a theoretical future for us um, that might happen. It's a really um, present here and now that is eating up increasing amounts of our budget and one only need to look outside today in the lower mainland um, to see what that looks like. This is our second major um, snow impact. Um, cities on the west coast don't have tax dollar bases that are intended to deal with those kinds of snow impacts and then there's infrastructure damage and other things and I, I could go on and on but it, it's a very good example of how um, people in Tory in the legislature today may be able to ignore um, extreme weather, we are not as local governments. So in 2009, uh, Vancouver made a commitment to be the greenest city in the world by the year 2020. 
and we're about halfway through, a little over halfway through now, and we've had some really strong results. So we've seen, it, it's a very broad program, it doesn't just look at climate and carbon, um, so we've seen, for example, a 23% percent reduction in waste going to landfill and incinerator. We've seen a 15 percent reduction in water consumption. Uh, our 2020 goal, which was to get uh, more than half of our residents moving by walking, biking, or transit, what we call active transportation, we were actually able to hit that goal in May 2015, halfway through. Um, and as a result of the combined actions, our greenhouse gas emissions are down by 15%, uh, which is quite impressive when you consider that our population and economy continue to grow. Uh, we're the strongest growing economy in the country, and not surprisingly, our population grows uh, quickly to, to as, as it attracts more people. Um, I tend not to like per capita uh, GHG emissions as a, as a measure, especially in an area growing like Vancouver, but I am going to bring it up only to give you an illustration of how cities can act even when the provincial or national framework may not support it. So in Vancouver, we're now down at 3.9 tons per capita GHGs. Uh, Calgary, or let me give you Toronto, Toronto's at 7.2 tons per capita, and Calgary is up at around 17.9 tons per capita. So even within the same national context, you can see that the choices that cities make on city policy uh, have a very substantial difference in the kinds of GHG uh, impacts that we're seeing. It's important to note that all of this work that I'm speaking to that Vancouver's done is not uh, it's not my work. I work very hard at it, um, but it's not solely me or solely the mayor or solely our council or even our staff. Um, cities have extremely narrow fiscal tools available to them uh, and even smaller jurisdictional capacity. Uh, national governments uh, in our case have been up until last year actively hostile to the agenda that we were pursuing, so we had no help there. And on a good day, the provincial government is indifferent to the sort of work that we were doing on environment. So it's all to say that the only way a city could get the kinds of results that we've seen is through effective partnerships. So in the last seven years since we initiated the Green City Action Team, uh, action plan, sorry. We've seen uh, the city working with over 180 different organizations that range from labor, nonprofit organizations, organizations like Pembina, who's been very engaged in the plan, uh, faith groups, churches, schools, uh, anyone who will partner with us, businesses, business organizations, and because that's who's actually mobilizing the results that that we speak to. And as a result, we've been able to undertake over 150 different policy initiatives across those 10 environmental policy areas. So I say all this because I feel like we, as much as we've become experts on green policy in a municipal context, we've kind of become a bit of experts on, on what it takes to have effective partnerships. So the three things that we have learned about good partnerships, um, one is that there are no junior partners. Uh, and you know we may come with different capacities, different sizes, but the, the thing we're bringing to the table, the reason we need to partner, makes us equally valuable. And I think uh, the provincial government, the current provincial government certainly has had a challenge understanding that framework at many policy levels, uh, but I think all provincial parties, in my experience, um, have a difficult time understanding that while municipalities uh, may be quite small, I mean we have a municipality in, this, in the region here who's under a thousand residents, it doesn't mean that they don't bring critical and equal value to the partnership. Uh, the second thing that we've learned about partnerships is that they can only work if roles, rights, and responsibilities within that partnership are clearly defined. A uh, good partnership is kind of like a good relationship, so the more self-aware that you are um, and the more self-aware your partner is, the easier it is to find um, the kinds of ways that you can work together productively. Uh, we have not seen that clarity of roles, uh, rights and responsibilities with the current provincial government, um, and I'll speak a bit to the platforms and where we see some opportunities there, and I would say within this broad category of roles, rights, and responsibilities, it doesn't matter if there's not an accountability framework by which both partners can hold the other one accountable if they are acting, uh, not they're failing to meet their responsibilities or their rights are being infringed on by the other party. So finally, um, create the space, not the to-do list. So. Uh, what we would be looking for is a framework for the provincial government that enabled municipal action but didn't uh, prescribe a to-do list. So to give uh, an example that may make sense to those of you who have children or who, who have children in your family that are close to you, 
uh, having the power to be able to tell someone to do something does not mean that they actually are going to do it. And I think we see often in governments, particularly in provincial and municipal relationships across the country, uh, this, this dynamic plays out. And what you get is more arguments about um, the, the dynamic than you do actual um, output. So what we would be looking for is a framework that allows us to find the way that we can best meet the needs of our residents at the street level, because that's an expertise we have and can bring to a partnership, um, not an extensive to-do list about what the province thinks might be the best thing for our municipality. So evaluating the major party platforms against that. Um, the Liberals, of course, haven't released the platform, but they have a body of work that we can rely on. Um, cities have had to fight to be visible in their process every step of the way. In fact, when the climate leadership team was first announced, uh, there was a number of sectors that they said that they would be working closely with and consulting, and municipalities weren't even referenced in there, despite the fact that municipalities in British Columbia are responsible for over 55% of greenhouse gas emissions. So we did work hard, and we're finally able to get three representatives on the climate leadership team, uh, although as I think I know all the panelists know and probably everybody listening, as it happened, the climate leadership team ended up to not be uh, that significant of a factor in determining the final uh, cap, the Climate Action Plan 2.0 from the province. So uh, yeah, it's hard. Minutes. Thanks, Joshua, for that. Um, so it's hard to know um, what comes next. I, I did because I don't want to leave it out. I uh, want to note that there were two things in the climate plan that was released that are of use to cities. They are, um, you know, they do fall into the framework, not the to-do list. So that's the Provincial Energy Step Code, which mirrors Vancouver Zero Emissions Building uh, Plan. We have our own building bylaw, so it's not particularly um, of use for Vancouver, but we think it would be very useful for other municipalities. They also have committed to incentives for high-performance buildings. Um, the devil is really in the details there, so it's difficult to say whether that's positive or negative. For the NDP, uh, they just released, I think somebody referenced it, uh, Elizabeth, that they've released a plan. It is principle-based, so we're not seeing specific details, but to my points about what makes an effective partnership, it's actually very encouraging to see that they aren't creating a to-do list, um, and the principles certainly align well with what we would expect in partnerships. Uh, finally, on the Greens, they haven't yet released a platform. Uh, they do have a policy document on their site. I have to say I, I was a bit disappointed by it. It has mechanisms that I, you know, as a, a voter certainly would like to see in there, like the carbon tax. Uh, there is not one mention of municipalities in relation to climate and carbon, uh, and building and transportation sectors are almost completely absent. So uh, it, it's difficult to evaluate that because it's not intended. It's a policy document on their website as opposed to um, a platform that they're bringing into the election. But here's an opportunity. Hopefully they have some representatives listening in today. Um, to think about what that might look like moving forward. The final thing I wanted to touch on uh, was Elizabeth's question about which jurisdiction uh, one would evaluate BC's climate policies or actions against. I, um, over the holidays, had some time to do more reading than I, I get to do, and I read a Bill McKibben article, which I will paraphrase. He says, this isn't a contest between Democrats and Republicans, it's a contest between human beings and physics. And I think we're very much kidding ourselves if we think that um, all of our political discussions are somehow going to trump scientific reality. So ultimately, whatever plan comes out of a, a party who becomes government will be judged by the climate itself, regardless of what we feel about it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrea. Um, lots to think about in there. Um, so we are now going to open this up to questions. Uh, we have a number of questions that have started coming in already. Um, and I'm going to start with a very easy one, which I should have addressed right up at the front, which is um, that these slides will be available to attendees. We'll have them up in the next uh, few days or so um, to, uh, on our website at pebita.org, and you, you can grab them there. So apologies for not having mentioned that off the top, and I hope people weren't madly scribbling notes in, uh, uh, in the fear that they would not get these slides. Um, all right, so um, I'm going to start off with uh, a question for Andrea, and anyone else can join in as well if they're if they're interested. Um, so this question is uh, um, from 
Trevor Barry, and curious about the cities versus regions achievements. Could Vancouver be lucky to act in a bit of a vacuum or even increase leakage of GHG increases in neighboring local governments? So I think that's a, that's a question about, um, you know, how, how is Vancouver ensuring that, uh, that, that your initiatives aren't causing carbon leakage to other regions? Sure, that's a, that's a good question. It is one of the challenges of balancing good governance and I think the system that we have in the region of autonomous uh, local governments and the number we have works well at many levels. Uh, but when you're dealing with issues that are region-wide, province-wide, nationwide, um, global in scope, it can be a challenge to align policies. Vancouver does have its own charter, so I think when we are working well together as a region. Um, Vancouver is using the charter to, to beta test, building bylaw for example, so that then the province can bring in, uh, have a confidence in bringing in changes to the community charter and the individual cities feel comfortable um, because they can point to examples and say, yep, yeah, this really works. And in fact, innovate and push us further uh, and we can respond quickly to it. So I think um, when the information is flowing well and there is uh, a desire to work together on issues, it can go quite well. I, I think that it's more challenging on issues like transportation where we have the third layer of a uh, provincially appointed board um, and it becomes a lot more political. So when I spoke to this being a very much a political opinion I'm expressing, it's really about that, the politics of intergovernmental relations and how difficult those become when you don't have the clarity of you no know, junior partners, here's your roles, rights and responsibilities, here's the accountability mechanism that we can enforce those by, as well as the framework, not the to-do list. And I think where we've seen the biggest challenges is on the transportation side, not through a fault of Vancouver or the other cities in the region, but through the a perplexing decision by the province around the governance structure that they've chosen. Great, thanks very much. Um, all right, so this uh, question is uh, out to anybody who wants to answer it from our panelists. Um, it's about LNG and should we address the issue that an expanded LNG footprint means the policy impacts on the rest of the economy and society have to be more stringent? For example, 20 LNG plants would have us all walking or biking. Uh, does anybody want to comment on that? I can take a first stab at it. Um, yeah, so it really depends on the scale of, of uh, LNG. Um, in the work that I was sharing, that was three LNG facilities coming online, something equal to Pacific Northwest, LNG Canada, um, and wood fiber. Now, if those came on as designed and, and as approved right now, you basically you have to reduce emissions in buildings and transportation and the rest of the industrial sector to make up for that. Um, but that doesn't necessarily have to be the case in the climate leadership team work, some other work that Clean Energy Canada had done. That scale of development um, with more policies on how natural gas is produced, electrifying, um, reducing methane emissions, um, also at the facilities themselves running more on, renewable, uh, on renewables, renewable electricity, um, that could actually fit within a um, uh, scenario where we're reducing um, emissions uh, within British Columbia. So you either go after LNG or you have to uh, really target the other sectors, which would be which would be difficult. Um, can I jump in now? Um, on this as well is I don't think it's necessarily a matter of, of picking between LNG and forcing everyone else to ride bikes. Um, what I would more recommend is make sure if, if we have a very broad carbon price, whether part of it's a carbon tax, might some of it might be more of a, for export industries, you can implement more of a hybrid carbon tax cap and trade regulatory system um, and ensure that the price is the same across different, different uh, activities. Um, and then you let the firms and individuals choose which, which which activities we're going to do, where our emissions going to come from, where our redu reductions going to come from, and you're going to reduce emissions in the, the most cost-effective way. Um, can I, I'm going to jump in, Joshua. Um, it's exactly why Vancouver went to the 100% renewable goal, because I think every minute that we're spending talking about emissions reductions and how we're going to sort of fold the paper in half one more time to try and get those reductions is a minute we're not spending into these, the, 
the meetable challenge of how to build 100% renewable energy, but a challenging one, right? As we're arguing about all these fossil fuel projects, who's going to get that 20% that's left over after the reductions? We're not having the discussions we need to have about how we're going to get the dollars and the people uh, connected that we need to in order to make the transition that we all, by virtue of the fact that we have to reduce fossil fuel consumption, we know that we therefore must increase renewable energy, and we've been avoiding having that discussion. There is not, there's no gold star for doing a little bit better on climate, and the climate, the atmosphere of science is very clear on this. We just need to figure out how to get it done. All right, thanks everybody for that. Um, I am going to go to another question here, actually, which is about the role of electricity. Um, and uh, the comment here is, BC Hydro, with its Power Smart program, has cultivated the idea that energy is a bad word. Actually, electricity is not the problem, and I assume this person means from a climate point of view, um, but the solution uh, to climate challenges. Um, so I guess this is a question about how can we, how can we, the question is how can we change this false culture? How can we talk about the role of electricity in decarbonizing um, our energy systems? Does anybody want to take a crack at this one? Sure. Well, um, so electricity, I think, completely essential, especially in British Columbia. We have a very uh, clean grid, and whether it's transportation, uh, or buildings uh, or industry, electricity can play a key role there. And there's a bit of conflict right now because there are conservation is, is going to be a piece of that. But if you get an electric vehicle, your electricity use is probably going to go up. Um, and a friend of mine has an electric vehicle, started plugging in, not using gasoline, and then gets a friendly reminder that you might want to consider conservation um, while you just switch to um, to a much cleaner form of, of transportation. Um, so I think we don't have all the, the solutions for that. I think it's a mix of you know identifying where electricity can play that role. Um, and then BC Hydro, um, in the climate leadership team, there was a, a recommendation there where uh, BC Hydro could play a more positive role on seeing electrification, moving to renewables um, as, as part of its mandate. And we've seen a few. Um, uh, points come out that BC Hydro is starting to think that way, but the question, I guess, is, is how um, how is it going to play that role? And I don't actually have the answers for that yet, but I think over the next year um, we should uh, figure out how BC Hydro could play that, you know, supporting, uh, reducing, uh, conserving when necessary, but then also supporting the use of electricity when it makes sense. Anyone else want to jump in on this one? All right, so now we're going to just uh, do something a little bit different here. We're going to go to um, uh, an audience um, poll, and it should be up on your screens now. And the question we're looking for your input on is, do you think climate change will play a significant role in the upcoming BC election? Uh, so you should see that poll. You can click one of the three options, and then we will, we will close that up. And as we are um, finishing this poll, it's all coming in live real time here. Um, while that's going, I'm just going to uh, go to the next question for the panelists. And um, sorry. Give me one second here. OK, so this is a question for Joel. Um, Joel, given that uh, Quebec and Ontario are going with cap and trade, have decided to do cap and trade, um, and do you think BC should move in this direction as well? Um, so I'm going to throw that question over to, to Joel as we're getting the results of the poll. Um, I, I, I think there, there's a lot of value in the, the approach we've already taken with the carbon tax and, and continuing to move in that way. Um, because it sends a much clearer signal to to individuals and businesses about um, um, the carbon price um, with cap and trade. Uh, that say say with retail gasoline, the cost of the cap and trade system, the added cost is going to be buried in the gasoline price that people pay. Um, whereas in BC, when when uh, people are filling up their cars. 
um, they see the carbon tax on the pump and the research has suggested that there might be this salience effect where people are actually because the tax is more visible people are uh, responding to it um, more than they would otherwise if it, if it looked just like a gasoline price fluctuation. Um, and with some of our export, carbon intensive export, um, export exposed industries um, like say LNG or, or, or others, um, there, there, there might be a, a, a good case for moving to a cap and trade system, but um, the system that's kind of being already the regulatory system that's being proposed in BC, which is similar to what what Alberta has implemented for their large emitters, um, where they have to meet an, uh, a carbon intensity standard and then they have to comply with that standard or buy credits or pay into a tech fund. Um, it's, it's, it's similar to a cap and trade system but slightly different but still minimize, minimizing the effect on competitiveness of those, those, those uh, industries. Um, so it, either one, either the cap and trade or that to, to, to maintain the competitiveness of kind of our, our carbon intensive but trade exposed industries for, for the, the, the time being it is a smart way to, to go. So, uh, so um, thank you for that Joel and I see that we've got the results of our poll up here. Uh, do you think climate change will play a significant role in the upcoming BC election? So we have about Half of us thinking it will, um, about a, a quarter unsure and a, and a quarter thinking no. Um, Elizabeth, I'd love to hear your uh, opinion on this question. What, what, uh, how do you feel climate will, will play? Will it be significant in this election? Uh, I think climate change is going to be top of mind for people in the election. Uh, what I think will be more of a challenge is having people understand what the province's role in climate is. Uh, because uh, things like uh, the Kinnemorgan Trans Mountain Expansion are such a, a hot button issue here, uh, I think there's some confusion in what role the provincial government plays with that pipeline versus the federal government having the actual authority to approve those projects. Um, I think people are, are going to struggle a little bit more to understand the finite details of the different climate plans. I know that that's been a challenge for me as a journalist to decipher what those different policies mean, what the plan really says. Like climate science is, is, not, is not easy to understand for those of us who don't have a scientific background. So, uh, you know, who has the, who has the better plan uh, and, and what that plan means and what that plan means for the average taxpayer, I think, is going to play a big role, especially now that we're having all of this very much highlighted in the spotlight, both uh, south of the border and with the federal government's new uh, pan-Canadian framework as well. Sorry. Uh, do any of the rest of you want to comment on that question? Um, it's Andrea. I'm, I'll jump in on it. Uh, I think I mean, every election, okay, every is a strong word in politics. Most elections come down to a, a very singular question. The one down south is sort of baffling everybody, it, in my opinion, had exactly the same question, which is, whose side are you on? That is what, when you walk into a ballot box, that a, a voting booth, um, that's what you're marking your X based on, is your belief on whether this candidate is on my side or not on my side. Um, so the, the challenge for climate-related issues is, the personification of that can be challenging, right? So what is the expression of how this candidate has shown they're on my side or not? And I think that's why Kinder Morgan has had such resonance, um, is because there's a feeling that um, democracy itself was um, uh, fundamentally changed and in very negative ways for people in terms of their lack of access to that process at the federal level. Um, and there were people like the city of Vancouver, city of Burnaby, city of Victoria, almost every municipality actually in southwestern BC fighting to get that access for people and people said, hey, you're on my side. Uh, the city, or sorry, the province of BC until recently was seen as being part of that effort to give people a voice, but their environmental approval process um, certainly suggests that perhaps they weren't on the side of people looking to have a voice in that process. So I think the success of climate at 
in this election will be whether or not we there's issues that personify that concern about whose side you're on. Anyone else quickly on this one? We'll go to our last question otherwise. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, I think it'll, I, I think in the election it, it'll focus more on, on, on specific issues like LNG expansion or, or and the climate impacts of LNG or it'll focus on the, the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion and it won't, I, I don't anticipate the climate plans being uh, being kind of front and center um, being debated um, whereas it'll, I think it'll focus more on the, those kind of specific projects. Okay, thank you. And then we just have a, a comment from the audience here that uh, the poll result may have been different if we had asked the question, uh, do you think climate change will play as significant a role in the election as it should? So yes, there are a couple of different versions of this question we certainly could have asked and probably would have gotten different answers. Um, I, I wanted to squeeze in one more question, but I, we, are at the, we are at the top of the hour here, folks, so my apologies. Um, but we, there are a number of questions in the question box, some of them fairly specific about the modeling. Uh, that we will make sure that we get back to you uh, on if we if we can track you down and answer them. Um, so I would like to just thank very much our our participants for joining us today and to thank our panelists for taking the time to share their thoughts on this issue. Our, our webinar recording, as I mentioned, will be posted on the website and uh, it will be available for you. So we'll make sure to get it out to all of you who have participated in the webinar today. And uh, with that, I wish you a lovely rest of your day, and thanks again for participating. Thank you. Oh my gosh.